Hello there and welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to review classical conditioning. To start, we need to talk about the behavioral perspective in psychology, which is all about how we learn from our environment. The focus here is how an individual's actions are influenced through their environment. Oftentimes, learning here happens through conditioning, which involves forming associations between two events or responses. Conditioning is a type of learning where an individual will link one stimulus to another other. This connection often causes a certain reaction to occur. Now, I mentioned the word stimulus. A stimulus is an event, object, or thing that triggers a specific reaction. We can see there is a neutral stimuli, which are stimuli that elicit no response from a subject. For example, the objects in the background of this shot. Even though you've seen them multiple times in my videos, they probably never have really gotten a reaction from you. The next type is an unconditioned stimulus, which is a stimulus that naturally triggers a response. There's no teaching that's needed here. For example, going for a walk with your dog will naturally excite your dog. The walk is the stimulus and it leads to an unconditioned response, which is excitement. An unconditioned response is a natural response that happens without any learning. In this case, the dog is getting excited by the walk. Lastly, there is a conditioned stimulus, which is when a previously neutral stimulus is paired repeatedly with an unconditioned stimulus, triggering a learned response, also known as a conditioned response. Remember, a conditioned response is a learned response to a conditioned stimulus, while an unconditioned response is a natural response that happens without any learning. For example, let's say that every time you're going to take your dog on a walk, you first go get the dog leash. Eventually, the dog sees the leash and gets excited, even though no walk occurs. In this example, the leash is the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response is the excitement. The leash used to mean nothing to the dog. However, now the dog associates the leash with a walk. Now, I realize these terms are easy to mix up. So to make sure that you don't mix them up, I created different practice problems for you that give you different scenarios where you'll have to identify the different stimuli and responses. Plus, I included explanations for each problem to make Make sure that you understand why the answers are what they are. Now, the process of developing a connection between a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus is known as acquisition. One famous example of acquisition and classical conditioning is Pavlov's experiment with dogs. Pavlov noticed that dogs naturally salivate when they taste food, which would make the food an unconditioned stimulus and the drooling of the dog an unconditioned response. Pavlov wanted to see if he could condition a dog to associate food with a neutral stimulus. For his experiment, he chose the sound of a bell, which on its own really meant nothing to the dog. During the process of acquisition, Pavlo would ring the bell every time he was about to give the dog food. Eventually, after repeating this process many times, the dog started to associate the bell with the arrival of food, changing the bell from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. Now, when the dog heard the bell, Pavlov noted that the dog started to salivate, even before the food was presented. To test these results, Pavlov Pavlov eventually stopped bringing the food out after he rang the bell. The result was that after the dog heard the bell, the dog would still salivate. Now, if Pavlov continuously rang the bell but did not present the dog food, the dog would start to salivate less and less. This is known as extinction, which is when the conditioned response gradually diminishes. This happens when the conditioned stimulus is repeatedly presented without being paired with the unconditioned stimulus, causing the association between the two to weaken. Interestingly enough, though, Pavlov also discovered that if time passed without the dog hearing the bell, say an hour or so, the dog would still salivate to the bell again. This is known as spontaneous recovery. This is the reappearance after a pause of an extinguished conditioned response. We can see this process graphically. When acquisition is occurring, we have our neutral stimulus paired with our unconditioned stimulus. As time goes on, the strength of the conditioned response intensifies. In Pavlov's case, this was the bell, which was the neutral stimulus, and the food, which was the unconditioned stimulus. Now we can also see if we just have the conditioned stimulus by itself without the unconditioned stimulus, extinction starts to occur. And as more time passes, notice that the strength of the CR decreases. However, if we pause for a period of time, we can see spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response occur. 
But if we have the CS alone again, extinction starts again. Now Pavlov also wanted to see if after conditioning occurred, if the dog would respond to other stimuli that were similar to the original bell. What Pavlov discovered is that certain tones that were similar to the bell would cause the dog to salivate as well. This is known as stimulus generalization, which is when an individual responds to a stimulus that is similar to the original conditioned stimulus. Pavlov also found that the dog could be taught not to respond to similar sounding stimuli. For example, if Pavlov only gave food to the sound of a particular bell, the dog would start to not salivate to other sounds. This process is known as stimulus discrimination, which is when an individual learns to differentiate between the conditioned stimulus and other similar stimuli. Now, one other concept that we need to talk about when it comes to conditioning is higher order conditioning. This is also known as second order conditioning, and it is when a neutral stimulus that has become a conditioned stimulus is paired with with another unconditioned stimulus. For example, say that we have a dog that is conditioned to salivate to the sound of a bell. We could change things up and turn on a light right before we ring the bell and then give the dog food. If we continue to repeat this process, eventually the dog would associate the light with the food and would salivate at the light alone, even though the light was never directly paired with the food. Now I realize in that quick overview of classical conditioning, we talked about a lot of concepts. So to make sure that you have extra practice, I created some practice quizzes on conditioning and put them in the ultimate review packet. Make sure to check them out once you're done with this video. All right, now one way in which classical conditioning is used in the real world is is in counter conditioning therapy. Here therapists use classical conditioning to help clients unlearn harmful emotional responses. The goal here is to replace an unwanted emotional response, such as a fear, with a more positive or neutral response. For example, if a person has a phobia of spiders, a therapist might have their client relax in a space where they feel comfortable in, surrounding the client with relaxing music and visuals, and then gradually showing the client images of spiders. As the client becomes more comfortable with the images, the therapist then might start to slowly show videos and eventually maybe the real thing. Over time, the client can learn to feel more relaxed instead of anxious around the spiders and associate the spiders with a more neutral response. Another way in which classical conditioning impacts individuals is through taste aversions, which is a type of classical conditioning where an individual learns to avoid particular tastes, flavors, or food because they associate it with illness. For instance, let's say that you and your friends went out to eat at a new restaurant. You have a great time with your friends, but later that night you end up getting sick and you're on the toilet all night and it's a bad day. You probably are going to associate sickness now with that restaurant and will be hesitant to even go back in the future. Notice that in this example, it only took one negative experience to associate the restaurant food with sickness. Taste aversion only requires one pairing of food and sickness to form a strong association. This is referred to as one trial learning, since it only takes one pairing to create an association. Taste aversions can happen after one pairing generally because our bodies and brains are wired to quickly identify harmful associations. This survival technique where people and animals naturally form associations between certain stimuli and responses is known as biological preparedness. We can see that humans and animals are biologically predisposed to associate food with illness more quickly than other stimuli. This is to help them avoid harmful foods in the future, which is just one of the reasons why restaurants take food safety so seriously. One negative customer experience can end up permanently tarnishing their reputation. All right, now we have one last concept left to review, and that is habituation, which is when an organism gradually stops responding as strongly to a stimulus that is repeated over time. With habituation, an individual is learning from a repeated stimulus, which then results in a decrease in the individual's responsiveness to the stimulus. Now, don't get this confused with sensory adaptation, which is when an individual gets used to an unchanging stimulus. All right, there you have it. Another topic review video done. Now you know the drill by now. Go take those practice quizzes in the ultimate review packet and check out the other resources as well. Also remember, if you found value in this video, consider subscribing so you get notified when I post new psychology videos. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time online.